I'm sure you've all heard uh, plenty of cheatgrass stories, and I promise you this is one you've never heard before. Uh, we, we've all had the cheatgrass experience of picking them out of our socks. We hopefully have not had our favorite hunting spot uh, lost to flames. Um, there are relatively few tools in the 100 million acre cheatgrass toolbox for control, and I'm working on one that is very different than what you've heard of before, and I think you'll be impressed at how well it works. So I'd like to start by bragging about somebody else's research, and this is called the Rangeland Analysis Platform, or the RAP. This is a free web Google Earth type environment that I just love. Uh, I think it was developed at the University of Montana with BLM funding. So I just took a screen capture of Reno, and everything you see in red here is from the year 2018, and uh, it is the annual cover of cheatgrass or annual grasses. So needless to say, Reno is one of those places that uh, uh, is, I don't know if any place wants to be known as the epicenter, maybe the Western United States is the epicenter. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I saw some large cheatgrass areas even on the plane flying in today. So what I did to show what else this rangeland analysis platform can do is I took a screenshot just and I drew a polygon just north of Reno. I'm not sure if you can see this uh, red box, but it's uh, thousands of acres in size and they have not just given us pretty pictures with this uh, tool, this Landsat image based tool, but they will show us the trend in perennial cover, tree cover, shrub cover, annual grass cover since 1984 when they first started collecting these images. Uh, so if, if it's kind of hard to pick out all the, the lines in here, but I'll point to this brownish red color. That is the annual grass line and the year that has that big spike is 2017. So I'm not from the Reno area, but I'm, I'm willing to bet there's somebody in the audience who would concur 2017 was a cheatgrass year uh, in the, the Reno area. So I will bring this back to Wild Horse Island, but I want to introduce this cheatgrass problem as we, one of our key habitat problems in the Western US and clearly to this audience, you, you know that well. What I would like to talk about today is something you might not spend much time thinking about is soil health. And soil health is something we all want to have, but it's a little hard to define what that is. There have been an increasing number of peer reviewed papers on this over the past decades. And most of this is driven by sustainable agriculture and carbon management in the soil. So if I just borrow from Kibble White, somebody much smarter than I am, soil health is a term which is widely used within discussions on sustainable agriculture to describe the general condition or quality of soils, the soil resource. Soil management is fundamental to all agricultural systems, yet there's evidence for widespread degradation of agricultural soils in the form of erosion, loss of organic matter, contamination, compaction, increased salinity, and other harms. This degradation sometimes occurs rapidly and obviously, for example, when poor soil management leads to gully erosion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're not gonna find many peer-reviewed papers on soil degradation in rangeland or in bighorn sheep habitat. This is work that really has, has not been done by and large, and I'm not here to tell you that I have done this work either, but uh, I want to represent soil health as being fundamental to the health of the western U.S. rangeland and wildlife. And that is a story that I'm going to tell you uh, on the way to talking about Wild Horse Island. So the rangeland that we have now is maybe not the one we want to have. Uh, this is just a diagram I made to assail the uh, the presence of cheatgrass in our degraded vegetation condition with relatively smaller amounts of the perennial forage that our wildlife friends would like to have. We have diminished wildlife habitat and the 
CO2 instead of being sequestered in the soil, thinking about carbon sequestration because cheatgrass is an annual plant, grows from seed every year. Uh, annual plants sequester much less carbon in the soil than do perennial plants. So between fires and low soil quality and the wrong vegetation, we have a, an unsustainable and undesirable condition. So my pitch is that we want to have rangeland that has much less annual grass in it. I think we're gonna have to learn to love annual grasses a little bit because we're never gonna go to zero, but we need to have a whole lot less and we'd like to reverse the carbon um, in the atmosphere and have it be a soil resource uh, as it's sequestered in the root zone by uh, deep-rooted perennial species like the bunch grass communities we know from, from the western U.S. So how are we going to do that? So we're going to fix the soil. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm probably the only soil scientist in the room or geoscientist, and I'm going to keep this high elevation, but... Uh, my goal, in addition to reducing the amount of herbicides we use in our world and having residual herbicide traces in our food and our microbrews, we would like to have less use of herbicide in our rangeland and grow native perennial vegetation, control invasive plants, sequester carbon, create nutrient-dense soil, reduce fire intensity and frequency, and get back to managing these systems for a balance of inputs and withdrawals. And you notice I haven't really drilled down onto that I'm, I'm presenting an herbicidal approach. This is not herbicidal. And I could spend another hour talking about the origins of petrochemical agriculture, but if somebody told you to control the weeds in your yard, if you didn't go out and spray 2,4-D on your dandelions, or go dig them by hand, you would have relatively few tools in your, your toolbox. So the tool I would like to th have you think about is, suppose we didn't invent petrochemical approaches to controlling weedy species in our, in our rangeland soils, and our turf soils, and our agriculture, how would we do that? And one answer that we'll never know is there were really good university scientists in the 1930s working on this. And I think what happened is that they could no longer find funding for their research because all the funding was provided by the petrochemical agriculture synthetic uh, industry. So that was the end of the research that was going on at, at that time. So to some degree, I'm picking up where some of those scientists left off. So to go from that Landsat image uh, view down to the ground level, this is what cheatgrass look like in my favorite configuration, which is unhappy. <laughs> and I will nominate myself for maybe having the most boring uh, possible activity uh, beyond counting million, looking for wildlife on millions of digital camera trap images, is watching plants grow. <laughs> That's right in there with watching the paint, paint fade. Because we never, like plants kind of happen to us. You know, if you're a gardener, or you're mowing your grass, you're kind of accustomed to the, the, how fast they're growing. But in a rangeland system, this time of year, we, we see so much of the dry and decadent litter from the previous growing season, and it's there forever, and it's there forever, and then it just gets a little hint of green in the spring, and then in a short time, suddenly the plants all grow to maturity, and then they cure out in the early or midsummer, and then we look at decadent dry plant material all the rest of the year. Um, so, but there is a lot, a lot going on, and what I would like to submit is that we have some options in front of us for changing how those plant communities grow and mature by what the nature of the soil chemistry is. So these little emergent cheatgrass plants, this is a photo from the early spring. Uh, so I fertilized this site, so there was no herbicide involved in uh, treating this site. I fertilized the site, I came back in the spring, and the cheatgrass looks really unhappy. 
and then I come back a year later and the cheatgrass is, is gone. Because if you look closely at this image, you can see that there are brown leaf plants, brown leaf tissue in addition to the chlorotic yellow. So these cheatgrass plants are determined to live. So the first leaves they put up were unsuccessful. They threw up another generation and another generation. Because the trick is to get this stuff not to produce seed because the seed is viable in the soil for say three to five years. Uh, so once, and there are really effective herbicides in the marketplace for spraying the growing cheatgrass leaf tissue. The trick is they don't do anything about the seed bank and the cheatgrass just grows back from the seed that's in the soil previously. There is a new herbicide coming that deals with the seed bank and I'll talk a little more about that. Next slide. So with the options we have in front of us, whether you're the Nevada Department of Transportation or you're the wildlife agency or you're the rancher, is you can reseed, you can use targeted grazing, burning, mowing, herbicide application, and there was a fungal technology, many of you may have heard of the black fingers of death that were going to, we were gonna put this microbe on the Western landscape and that was gonna be the end of cheatgrass. And, uh, that, that's listed among my uh, ineffective uh, technologies. It was a, a great hope, but it didn't work. And really most of these techniques are not very effective on cheatgrass because cheatgrass is such an aggressive competitor and it's so well adapted to our, our Western landscape. So my story today is an emerging alternative that works. So I used to teach a class at Montana State called Soil Remediation, and I taught for a semester on these two bullets of soils and plants. So I'm gonna boil it down to a much compressed uh, variation of that class today, but I'd like you to think of soil in, in a different way, in that it is really a gigantic heavy pile of ground up minerals with very little, bio, with a, a great deal of biological activity, but a very low amount of chemical uh, constituents that fuel those reactions. So in a gram of soil, there may be 10,000 species of microbes, not individuals. There are billions of species and 10, billions of individuals and maybe 10,000 species in a gram of soil. So the more carbon you have, the more microbes you have, the more potential you have for nutrient cycling. So we have all the raw ingredients for cycling nutrients in the soil. And our soil, if you take an acre of soil six inches deep, it might weigh two million pounds or a thousand tons. And of that thousand tons, maybe 1% of it is organic matter. So that would be about 10 tons of organic matter per acre. So an acre is a square, about 200 feet on a side. So it's a relatively small unit of land in the, the landscapes we work with, with uh, wildlife. And it's teeming with all these crazy microorganisms. And then on top of that, we're gonna throw a bunch of rainfall. And so if you're in a 12 inch precipitation zone, that's 43,560 cubic feet of water a year falling on that soil. So that works out to about 325,000 gallons of water. So if you're a plant, you are what you drink because that soil solution is how you're gonna get your nutrients out of the soil. That's how, what is gonna inspire you to grow and reproduce unless you're eaten by a bighorn sheep. However, most of our soils are relatively mineral depleted in terms of the, nu the nutrition that uh, is necessary to grow the late successional plant species that we think of in, in terms of, of wildlife habitat. Many of the constituents in the soil come from weathering the rocks that are there. So calcium or magnesium, uh, those are widespread, in, in, present in vast quantities, but the soluble constituent, or iron, for example, there are, iron soil is often uh, contains several percent iron, 
And so that would work out to tens of tons per acre, but you might only have a few parts per million of iron that are available to a plant in any, in any given year. So on the plant side of this, we want a healthy rangeland community with a diverse mix of grasses, forbs, shrubs, and that is our habitat where our wildlife friends live. And the plants require not just the macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but the micronutrients, iron, boron, copper, zinc, manganese, and molybdenum. And so this is sort of the, the strange space I found myself in, is that the nutritional requirements for all of these individual species are not known. So if you look up dandelion and you say, what is the nutritional requirement of zinc for dandelion? Nobody knows because any researcher at a university that did that never got tenure and they never got funded. And nobody ever did that work to write it up into a peer reviewed journal article. So going back to what Kurt was mentioning, my career work had been on working on mines and smelters. Well, these were all sites that had too much iron and manganese and copper and boron and zinc. So it made for a really interesting environmental laboratory and the short version of this story is that the weedy species didn't like the elevated micronutrients very much at all. So then the light bulb went on. I said to myself, what if I took a site that had cheatgrass and I added micronutrients to it out of a fertilizer bag on purpose? Would anything happen? So that is what I'm doing now to make cheatgrass go away. So this is what the future looks like for cheatgrass. And this is really hard to see. This looks really uninteresting because there are little teeny tiny white balls on the ground here. And those are little fertilizer pellets. And so I go out in the fall, I put fertilizer out on the young emerging cheatgrass. It hates it and it wakes up in the spring looking yellow. Next slide. So with that, as a starting point, let's talk about what happened at Wild Horse Island. So I had the good fortune of having some funding from the Montana chapter of the Wild Sheep Foundation. And so we went to Wild Horse Island to look and see what the cheatgrass problem there was, uh, whether this would be an applicable technology. And I have about a dozen slides in here to talk about Wild Horse. So here's a picture of Wild Horse Island. In the upper left, you can see it is an island in a giant in inland lake, much like Lake Tahoe in this part of the world. Uh, and on this lake live gigantic bighorn sheep. It sounds like a fairy tale. <laughs> they live on about 2,000 acres of ground. And if you look at that uh, Google Earth image, uh, you can see it's about 50% forested, it's about 50% south-facing grassland. And those of you in the front row may notice that those grasslands have a little reddish hue to them. I wonder what that could be. So we established three sites here, a disturbed site, a south-facing slope site. That was, these are kind of high, medium, and low cheatgrass sites. And we put out a, a set of plots. And I asked the manager there, I said, has, do you think the cheatgrass has been increasing or decreasing over time? And he said, well, I've been on this job for X years and we're really not sure. Uh, we suspect the cheatgrass is increasing. We're concerned that it is, but we don't really know. So going back to my, ripe, my rangeland analysis platform, I drew a polygon on the south side of the island. And I said, well, what do the Landsat images tell us? And if you look at the series in the, uh, the upper part of this graph, that's green. So that is the perennial grass cover. So it starts out in 1984 at about 50%. And there's some inter-year variation. But the latest year record is 2018, and that's 40%. So you, that's not a dramatic change. But then you look at the annual grass cover. So it starts out in 1984 at 15%, works its way up and down, 
and in 2018, it's 20%. So I'd submit that is a slow increasing change in vegetation cover where the 911 cubic inch world record bighorn sheep grew. Maybe if there was less annual grass, he would have been 912, <laughs> 920. Next slide. So here is the skull. Well, you don't need to see a picture of the skull. You just need to go to the exhibit hall here because that colossal skull is, is sitting there for you to... The real skull. Yeah. The real skull. This is the real one here on display. Yeah, that's amazing. So on display on the left side of this image are three types of annual grasses, soft brome, Japanese brome, and downy brome. They are all widely present on Wild Horse Island, as well as what I, the slide I titled The Next Generation. I, I have been to Wild Horse uh, three times now, and every time I've been there, I have seen full curl rams walking around. So that, that is exciting. Next slide. And while I could talk for an hour about Wild Horse Island, I'm just going to jump right to the, the findings because we, our time will pass quickly here today. Uh, after no, so we put these plots in in September of 2018. We went back to monitor in June of 2019. So the yellow highlighted numbers are the monitoring event from June. But the, the quick version of this story, and I have a graph in the next slide to follow, so this will be exhibited graphically. These are the overall means. But at the disturbed site, we went from 91% annual grasses to 5%. And on the moderately affected site, we went from 18% to 4%. Next slide. That's what uh, Wild Horse Island looked like before treatment. And you wouldn't even recognize that as cheatgrass. It just looks like decadent uh, you know, fall forage in, in western Montana. But we got down on our hands and knees and carefully measured. Next slide. Here's my friend Neil Anderson. This is uh, the biologist applying the fertilizer. So this is very low tech. Uh, this is, there are no drones. There's no AI. This is Neil out in the field getting the job done. Next slide. So here are the, the data in graphical form for the disturbed sites. So that was the, the worst of the sites. We had three different rates of application. We had a low, a medium, and a high. And the annual grass cover went from 82% to 9% in the low treatment, 95 to 3 in the medium, 89 to 5 in the high. And the control site went from 96 to 45 because we had a really hard time in that fall period of identifying the cheat grass of the previous year and the decadent perennial grass. So I, we overestimated the, the cheat grass. I think the actual amount of cheat grass is about 70%. But the, there is a lot of it and relatively small amounts of perennial grass. So our, our sheep friends would have starved to death if this was representative of the entire island. This is actually an area that was formerly homesteaded, so the, the ground was disturbed and the perennial grass is never, never reestablished. And this is what one of our, this is that, what that plot looks like. This is about a 1,600 square foot plot, so 40 by 40 feet. And it just looks like a bunch of green grass. It looks like there's no story to be told here. Like, how, how do I sell this as an amazing technology? But trust, <laughs> trust me, uh, Franz, the, the, the plant ecologist was with, was with me on his hands and knees counting all of the vegetation, all the species in the frames. And one thing you'll note is we over applied the fertilizer around the perimeter of the plot. So that's an example of how much you don't want to put on, but it helps define where the plot is, uh, have, having that boundary. But essentially, this amount of perennial grass is present out off the plot. It's just crowded out by all the cheat grass. Next slide. 
So my conclusions from Wild Horse is that our next steps are to continue monitoring. So this is just a snapshot of the first year. I have no reason to believe the conditions won't get better over time. Uh, we would like to scale up to a larger pilot or a full-scale project. So that is on uh, Kurt and Kevin to find a donor with a passion for sheep. State uh, of Nevada. Yeah, right. <laughs> Next slide. So I would be remiss in saying that this technology doesn't have some legs where it can be used elsewhere, like in Nevada or Idaho or Wyoming. And cheatgrass is widely present across the US. And it would appear if you live in Georgia, you don't have much cheatgrass. Well, I just, I just got a web link the other day that actually, no, cheatgrass is a problem in Georgia because it grows as a winter annual in turf. So it's a turf weed in Georgia. I had no idea. To us, it's a rangeland weed that causes epidemic fires, uh, maybe not so much in Georgia. So you can see these are small plots. These are 100, couple hundred square foot plots. And in all three of these examples, the untreated portion of the plot uh, is a combination of, say, 50% cheatgrass and 50% perennial grasses. And something magical happens right at the plot boundaries. The cheatgrass stops. So it, you can't see it from the back of the room, but there's a pink string line that goes to a stake. And the cheatgrass is almost entirely isolated to areas outside the plot. The same thing here, the, the cheatgrass, you can see the, the light colored seed heads, they come right up to the string line and they stop. Well, that's because we put fertilizer on the perennial grasses. That happens to be a fishing access site in Montana. Uh, so this, this is not limited to Wild Horse Island. The, the upper photo is an oil and gas field in Wyoming. The lower two are a fishing access site in Montana. Uh, here's a roadside. So here's an example of what it looks like after the first growing season. There's still a little bit of cheatgrass in it. We went from about 10% perennial grass in the untreated to about 30% in the first growing season. And cheatgrass dropped from about 60% to about 18%. Next slide. But this is the one I really love. This is that same hillside. This is a different view looking at it from across the road because this is three years later. So three years later, we are still, all the perennial grasses are still there. So we have 35% perennial grass now versus 14% in the untreated. We have a little bit less than 10% annual grasses versus 44%. And what I love about this photo is I got it at the right time when the cheatgrass was red and the perennial grasses were green so you could see the difference. But in the treated plot, in addition to growing, the healthy plants that were there in the first place have continued to grow, but they've also gone to seed and the seed has fallen on the soil and the perennial grasses have reproduced at a time when the cheatgrass seeds in the same soil have gone away. So this is really about soil restoration and really about creating the edaphic, the Greek word for of the soil, creating the edaphic conditions that lead to growing perennial grasses. And I think this would be even better, but there's kind of, being a road cut, they didn't replace the soil on this hillside. So it's even weedier than it would be normally, but there's a, a sandy layer in the middle of that hillside that you can see that's where most of the cheatgrass is in the treated plot. It's in that sandy lens mid-slope. If they put the soil back, I think we might have done even better. And to pick on my, my herbicide friends, there is an amazing new herbicide coming from Bayer called Esplanade, and it works great in certain applications. And one of those applications where it does not work is where you have to seed because this new herbicide is really effective at killing seeds in the soil. So it is a great tool to have for killing cheatgrass. 
seed. However, it also kills your native grass seeds. So if, if you have a site that has a really robust amount of existing native perennial vegetation with some, a cheatgrass component, it might be a great uh, herbicide for that application. So here's another amazing thing that happened on that hillside. I was out with a colleague and there was some cheatgrass growing in my plots. So we said, well, you know, my friend said, the cheatgrass, it looks different. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, the seeds don't look very big and they, they're kind of greenish colored and they don't look very healthy. So I took the seeds from the treated and untreated plots and I put them in a Petri dish and then I watered the Petri dish and I walked away. And 10 days later, the untreated cheatgrass seeds had all germinated and you could see the roots. So this is, this is my favorite kind of cheatgrass, the kind that doesn't germinate. And while I've been telling you I only do this using granular fertilizer, this also works using the fertilizer dissolved in water as a liquid. Uh, water weighs about eight pounds to a gallon. So my friend Joe was willing to, hold, to uh, carry the backpack sprayer and I'm guessing in this room, I'm not the only one who's walked around with a backpack sprayer. Um, I think that granular is a better way to go, but the liquid foliar application of the, the nutrient fertilizer works to inhibit cheatgrass as well. So in the tray on the right hand side, I sprayed half of that tray of cheatgrass in the fall. And in the spring, all the cheatgrass plants refused to grow where they had been sprayed. In the pots in the lower left, uh, the same story, the sprayed cheatgrass plant quit growing uh, days after it had been sprayed. But for this audience, there's, a, there's another photo I didn't put in here. Is on this, I had pots of blue bunch wheatgrass growing right next to these. And I said, well, I'm gonna spray blue bunch wheatgrass with this same, the same fertilizer, the same bottle, the same amount, the same day that I sprayed the cheatgrass. Well, the blue bunch wheatgrass was 100% unfazed, just kept on growing. Cheatgrass, dead. So as I mentioned, I've been working on this for a while, so Wild Horse Island is not the only place that I have been working. Uh, I've been trying different rates and different soil types. Um, I've talked long enough already. Let's just jump to the summary slide so this is that same data. So how much cheatgrass is left after these treatments? So I, I'm going from something like mid thirties of cheatgrass cover on average down to four to 7% essentially in the, the treated plots. So what I, would, what I would call these rates is this, the, the, 10, the 10 unit rate that would be sort of a preventative rate or a light rate that you would use on a plant community that had a lot of forb diversity and not very much cheatgrass. 25 would be the rate I would use as the optimum rate because the product, you know, fertilizers cost a dollar or two a pound. If you only have to use half as much compared to my standard rate of 50, that is the optimum rate. The 50 rate probably lasts longer, and the 75 rate is too much. Next slide. So you might wonder what happens to the perennial grasses. We saw that in that roadside project, and I can't say for sure if that's because the perennial vegetation is deficient, and I'm fertilizing it, and it's benefiting from the fertilization, or whether it's because the cheatgrass goes away, and the resources that are in the soil, including water, uh, go to the perennial grasses, or whether it's a combination of both of those factors. So here is an example, more of a landscape kind of view, the yellow line across the back. We, uh, we didn't treat the cheatgrass on the slope. We did cheat, treat the cheatgrass in the foreground. And that last one was a site that the rancher said, this is my worst pasture. Is there anything you can do? Uh, here's an example from Wyoming at an oil and gas field. 
uh, similar results to what I've showed you. And it takes a little bit of a botanist's eye to even tell that there's a difference. But if you look at the treated plot here, you see dried bunch grasses, a little spring green up. But what you have to look closely for is that this carpet of annual grasses that are getting established on the untreated site are absent now because of the treatment. But you would never know that if you're out walking through the field. It's a, about as interesting as counting images of what might be moving branches. So I, if I had several hours to talk about this, I could go into all of these details, but let me just prime, prime you with some questions. How long does it last? How much does it cost? Where can I get it? How does this work? How does it compare to herbicides? Is it harmful to desirable vegetation? Is it toxic to wildlife or livestock? Is it patent? Is it microbial or fungal? And why haven't I heard about this before? In conclusion, it's effective. It's made from ground up rocks. Remember, I'm a geologist. This is what happens when geologists do plant science. It's comprised of plant nutrients and unique formulations. It's non-toxic to workers and wildlife. It's easy to apply. It's long lasting. It's cost reasonable and it restores soil fertility. And with that said, if you want to talk more about this, I'm happy to carry on that conversation. I have business cards. I, uh, Kurt is up to his eyeballs in this. Uh, he, he knows how to find me. And uh, this, this is what uh, changing the soil looks like uh, on a property. So there, there are several tons of fertilizer in that hopper. And this is a uh, famous bison rancher that used to own a cable news channel. So he, he's got some test plots on his place now. <laughs>